Wednesday, September 14th, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky ventures outside the relative safety of the capital, Kiev, to celebrate the success of his army's offensive in a just-liberated Ukrainian city seized by the Russians early in their invasion. Russian President Putin and China's leader Xi meeting in Uzbekistan at the summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a bloc that China's promoting as a counterweight to U.S. and Western power. More fighting on the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan as each accuse the other of new rounds of shelling. Just two days before a national strike deadline affecting the nation's railroads, Mississippi Republican Senator Richard Burr asked for a unanimous Senate resolution that would force both the unions and the railroads to agree to an emergency board's recommendations and forego a strike or a lockout. California suing Amazon, accusing the company of violating the state's antitrust and unfair competition laws by stifling competition and engaging in practices that push sellers to maintain higher prices on products on other sites. And... Rare good news from the World Health Organization on the COVID-19 pandemic. The head of the WHO says the number of coronavirus deaths last week, the lowest reported number in the pandemic since March of 2020, marking what could be a turning point in the year's long global outbreak. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Maracle. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky made a rare visit outside Ukrainian capital today and highlighted Russia's retreat from a Ukrainian counteroffensive. With his hand on his heart, Zelensky watched the Ukrainian flag rise above the recaptured city of Izium. Russian forces fled the city last week as Ukrainian soldiers advanced in the northeastern Kharkiv region. Prosecutors found six bodies with traces of torture in recently retaken villages there. Speaking in English, Zelensky pointed to the death and destruction Russia had inflicted on the region. The view is very shocking, but it's not shock for me because we, we began to see the same pictures from Bucha from the first deoccupied territories. So the same, destroyed buildings, killed people, and so what can I say? That, that is the, 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 the part of our real history and the part of, of mo modern today's Russian nation. After almost six months under Russian occupation, Izium was left largely devastated, with apartment buildings blackened by fire and pockmarked by artillery strikes. Zelensky claimed Ukraine had recaptured more than 3,000 square miles in the northeast. The Russian retreat marks the country's largest military defeat since Russian troops withdrew from the Kiev area early in the war. While criticism of the invasion is increasing in Russia, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said after a phone call with Russian President Vladimir Putin that, quote, unfortunately, I cannot tell you that the realization has grown over there by now that this was a mistake to start this war. The Ukrainian government's counteroffensive has left more weapons in Ukrainian hands. A Ukrainian think tank said today that Russian forces likely left behind dozens of tanks, armored personnel carriers, and other heavy weaponry as they fled Ukraine's advance in the east. 
The Center for Defense Strategy said one Russian unit fleeing the Izium area left behind more than three dozen T-80 tanks and about as many infantry fighting vehicles. Another unit left 47 tanks and 27 armored vehicles behind. The center said Russian forces tried to destroy some of the abandoned vehicles through artillery strikes as they fell back. Typically, armed forces ruin equipment left behind so their opponent can't use it. However, the chaos of the Russian withdrawal apparently forced them to abandon untouched ammunition and weapons. Meanwhile, according to Ukrainian military intelligence, the Russian military is deploying so-called barrier troops in Ukraine to prevent its own units from fleeing. Ukrainian defense officials said that according to intercepted conversations, panic and refusals to fight are setting in among Russian troops. John Pfeffer of Foreign Policy and Focus spoke with Brian Edwards Tinker of the Upfront Show on the battlefield success of the Ukrainian army in recent days. That something dramatic has happened and that Russian forces have fallen back pell-mell um, and that this is... Uh, this is reminiscent even of, uh, if you're looking for historical analogies, going back all the way to, to World War I and on the uh, eve of the Bolshevik Re- Revolution when uh, Russian forces uh, that were involved in, um, in that war, that world war, were deserting at, at a furious pace and falling back to Russia itself. What do we know about the level of de- desertion within the Russian military? Well, uh, there's a combination of factors here. One, uh, there is a lot of prisoners of war that uh, Ukraine has taken uh, in this latest counteroffensive. In fact, so many that, uh, according to the Ukrainian government, they're not really sure how to house them all. Um, and then there are reports of Russian soldiers basically changing their clothes and, and running off um, from the field of battle. Um it's hard to know the numbers here. Um, we have uh, a report from the Ukrainian government of, I think, about 5,000 uh, casualties of deaths of Russian soldiers. But it's really hard to um, to know, uh, you know, the, the numbers of, of soldiers who have simply upped and left. Um, that those are probably not going to be available for some time. John Pfeffer, Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. More from reporter Simon Marks. President Zelensky claimed yesterday that thousands of square miles of territory have been liberated by Ukrainian forces. And while the precise scale of the country's success is still not independently confirmed, social media has been replete with video of civilians celebrating the arrival of Ukrainian forces in their liberated towns and villages. Inna Sovson is the deputy leader of the pro-European Golos party in Ukraine's parliament. The situation is different from town to town. So in some towns, there were major fights taking place over there, and we as well lost uh, lots of soldiers over there. But in some towns, uh, they have just left even before Ukrainian army actually approached the town. So the situation can differ for, from you know from case to case. But well, I'll tell you this: definitely, the mood in the country has changed very significantly. I was uh, overhearing people talking in the in the underground, in buses. Uh, um, everybody's talking about this counteroffensive, and general mood is this the Russians are running away and we are happy with that we want them to run as far as possible but it's not clear whether Ukraine can consolidate its gains the country's foreign minister said this week its armed forces need to brace for a fresh Russian offensive in the days and weeks ahead with FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. A spokesman for Ukrainian President Zelensky said the leader's car collided with another vehicle after a battlefield visit, but he was not seriously hurt. The accident happened early today. The spokesman said Zelensky was returning to Kiev from the Kharkiv region when a passenger vehicle collided with the president's motorcane in the Ukrainian capital. The driver of the other vehicle received first aid from Zelensky's medical team. The spokesman says medics examined the president, but he had no serious injuries. The spokesman says the circumstances of the accident are under investigation.
Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived in Uzbekistan today for a state visit, his first journey outside China's borders since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. She is attending the 22nd meeting of the Council of Heads of State of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, in the Uzbek city of Samarkand. The eight-nation SCO is led by China and Russia, who see the group as a counterweight to U.S. alliances in East Asia. Other SCO governments include India, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, and Tajikistan. Observers include Iran and Afghanistan. The Chinese leader is promoting a global security initiative announced in April, following the formation of the so-called Quad by Washington, Japan, Australia, and India in response to Beijing's more assertive foreign policy. She has given few details, but U.S. officials complain it echoes Russian arguments in support of Moscow's attack on Ukraine. Rosie Burchard reports from Samarkand. Samarkand is one of the most ancient cities on this planet for millennia. It's been a cultural crossroads and this week is no different as a dozen or so world leaders descend in what some observers say is a bid to tip the axis of global power away from the West. All eyes will be on an expected meeting between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping with Ukraine and Taiwan on their agendas. Moscow will likely be eager to project the image that despite Western sanctions imposed over its invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine, it's far from isolated on the global stage. The summit also puts the spotlight on Iran, which is tipped to be announced as a new member of the group. Rosie Burchard in Samarkand, Uzbekistan. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin today about exporting Russian fertilizer through Ukraine's Black Sea ports to address a growing global food crisis that threatens multiple famines. The UN chief said they also discussed security at Europe's largest nuclear plant, where he said bombing has stopped for the past three days and prisoners of war, which, he's, which he said he would like to see exchanged. Guterres told a news conference that Putin said a fact-finding mission he appointed at the request of Russia and Ukraine to investigate killings at the Solenik. Solenikiva prison in a separatist region of eastern Ukraine on July 29th will be able to go there in a way of Russia's choosing, according to Putin. The warring nations accused each other of carrying out the attack in which separatist authorities and Russian officials said 53 Ukrainian prisoners of war were killed and 75 were wounded. Guterres said the call to Putin was a follow-up to his meeting with Ukrainian President Zelensky in Lviv on August 18th and regular telephone calls to the head of Zelensky's office, Andrei Yermak. Putin is not attending next week's annual gathering of world leaders at the United Nations General Assembly, which Guterres said is taking place at a time of great peril for the world. More from reporter William Denislow at the UN. Addressing members of the press, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the world had enough food this year, but that distribution of it is an issue. He warned that the world is facing a fertiliser market crunch, and unless it's resolved, there could be food shortages in 2023. Guterres says he's spoken to President Putin and discussed the possibility of expanding the Black Sea Grain Initiative and increasing the export of Russian fertilisers. The Secretary General called for the removal of all barriers to the export of Russian fertilisers that aren't subject to sanctions. Speaking ahead of this year's UN General Assembly, Guterres said the current chances of a peace deal in Ukraine are minimal, but urged world leaders to come together and overcome divisions. William Danslow, New York. The death toll from clashes between Armenian and Azerbaijani forces increased 155 today as the two sides accused each other of a new round of shelling. 
after fighting on the border between the two adversaries erupted yesterday. Armenia's prime minister said 105 of his nation's soldiers have died since early Tuesday. Azerbaijan says it's lost 50 troops. The ex-Soviet countries have been locked in a decades-old conflict over the separatist Nagorno-Karabakh region. The United Nations Secretary General is calling for restraint. Stefan Dujaric is his spokesperson. He calls on the sides to take immediate steps to de-escalate tensions, exercise maximum restraint, and resolve any outstanding issues through dialogue within existing formats. He also urges them to fully implement previously reached agreements. The Secretary General expresses his support for the ongoing mediation efforts in the region. Nagorno-Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan, but has been under the control of ethnic Armenian forces backed by Armenia since the separatist war there ended in 1994. Azerbaijan reclaimed broad swaths of Nagorno-Karabakh in a six-week war in 2020 that ended with a Russian-brokered peace deal. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Just days before a national strike deadline affecting the nation's railroads, there's a mixed picture. Members of one union rejected a tentative deal with the largest U.S. freight railroads. Two unions ratified agreements. Three other unions remained at the bargaining table. A strike would intensify snarls in the nation's supply chain that have contributed to rising prices. Amtrak has already canceled a number of its long-distance trains this week, and it said the rest of its long-distance trains would stop on Thursday ahead of the strike deadline. All the tentative deals are based closely on the recommendations of a presidential emergency board that Joe Biden appointed this summer that's called for 24 percent raises and $5,000 in bonuses and a five-year deal that's retroactive to the year 2020. Those recommendations also include one additional paid leave day a year and higher health insurance costs. Mississippi Republican Senator Richard Burr asked for a unanimous Senate resolution that would force both the unions and the railroads to agree to the emergency board's recommendations. If we do not force this issue, at 12.01 tomorrow night, the railroads will shut down, and the economic impact on the American people is $2 billion a day. $2 billion. The key unions that represent the conductors and engineers who drive trains are holding out in the hope that railroads will agree to go beyond those recommendations and address some of their concerns about unpredictable schedules and strict attendance policies that they say make it difficult to take any time off. Vermont Independent Senator Bernie Sanders called the current working conditions absolutely unacceptable and almost beyond belief. Right now, if you work in the freight rail industry, one of the most grueling and dangerous jobs in America, you are entitled to a grand total of zero sick days. In case you missed it, let me repeat it. You are entitled to zero sick days. What that means is that if you as a worker get sick, if your child gets sick, if your spouse gets sick, and you need to take time off of work, not only will you not get paid, you actually could get fired. And that is precisely what is happening today in the rail industry. How crazy is that the rail unions want the railroads to provide unpaid leave time that workers could use to attend doctor's appointments or attend to other personal business without being penalized 
Labor Secretary Marty Walsh was holding talks with the railroads and the unions to try to avert a strike. Mental health clinicians at Kaiser Permanente marched on picket lines today as they have every day for the past month. More than 2,000 mental health therapists, psychologists, social workers, and chemical dependency counselors went on strike on August 15th in Northern California in the Central Valley. Their union says the strike is the culmination of a 12-year struggle by Kaiser therapists to try to make the health care giant provide the same level of care for mental health as it does for medical services. Both sides return to the bargaining table today. Apparently, the first negotiations since their walkout began. The largest nurses' strike against a private employer in U.S. history is wrapping up today in Minnesota. The union says the work stockage is not just about higher wages, arguing hospital executives are putting profits first. Mike Moen reports. The three-day walkout includes 15,000 nurses from more than a dozen hospitals in the Twin Cities and Duluth. Union leaders say while they're seeking higher wages, they stress that structural issues related to staffing make it harder to provide adequate care for patients. Brittany Livacari, an ER nurse at United Hospital in St. Paul, amplified that argument while speaking to reporters. The staffing shortages and crises within the hospital absolutely did not start with this pandemic. It started with lean management and staffing cuts. The pandemic just shed light on it and made it worse. She and other union members say they want to have more of a say in how hospitals are staffed. The Twin Cities Hospital Group criticized the nurses for choosing to strike before exhausting all negotiating efforts. It adds that several hospitals have reached tentative agreements on revised workplace safety measures. Contract talks have been dragging on for several months. State Representative Tina Liebling, who chairs the House Health, Finance and Policy Committee, says the entire state needs to know that each hospital needs skilled nurses to care for people's families, friends and neighbors. But she feels that message isn't getting through to administrators. Hospitals without the nurses are just buildings. We all know that. The Morning Consult firm recently reported that 18 percent of American health care workers have quit their jobs during the pandemic, while another 12 percent have been laid off. Meanwhile, in Minnesota, contingency plans were put in place to avoid care disruptions during the strike. However, some patients might see scheduling changes for non-urgent care. Mike Moen, Minnesota News Connection. California is suing Amazon, the world's largest online retailer. Attorney General Rob Bonta announced the lawsuit today, which accuses the company of violating the state's antitrust and unfair competition laws by stifling competition and engaging in practices that push sellers to maintain higher prices on products on other sites. In today's lawsuit... We allege Amazon's practices violate California unfair competition law and the Cartwright Act by thwarting the ability of other online retailers to compete, contributing to Amazon's dominance and harming merchants and consumers through inflated fees and higher prices. These unlawful practices are centered on the contracts Amazon makes at the retail and wholesale levels to prevent effective price competition. In the lawsuit, California Attorney General Bonta's office said Seattle-based Amazon used contract provisions to effectively bar third-party sellers and wholesale suppliers from offering lower prices for products on non-Amazon sites, including their own websites. Bonta said that amounts to artificial price inflation. He used the example of recent back-to-school sales on backpacks. The merchant cannot allow that backpack to be sold for a lower price on Amazon's competitors, Walmart, Target, eBay, and in some cases, even on the merchant's own website. The price is artificially inflated on Amazon's site. If the merchant does not comply with Amazon's demands, she may have to compensate Amazon For the difference between the Amazon price and the off-Amazon price, she may face serious sanctions, including less prominent listings and even the possibility of termination or suspension from Amazon. 
The 84-page lawsuit filed in San Francisco Superior Court mirrors another complaint filed last year by the District of Columbia. A federal judge dismissed that lawsuit, and it's now on appeal. But officials in California say they believe they won't encounter a similar fate, partly due to information collected during a more than two-year investigation that involved subpoenas and interviews with sellers, Amazon's competitors, as well as current and former employees at the e-commerce giant. In a statement, Amazon said Attorney General Bonta has it exactly backwards. Amazon claimed that the relief Bonta seeks would force Amazon to feature higher prices to customers. Amazon controls roughly 38% of online sales in the U.S., more than Walmart, eBay, Apple, Best Buy, and Target combined. Bonta's lawsuit asks for a judge to end Amazon's anti-competitive contracts, notify vendors that will no longer require they offer prices on par with Amazon's, and order compensation be paid to consumers who faced increased prices, among other actions. Bonta did not rule out other actions should more information present itself during the litigation process. What's believed to be the first monkeypox death in the U.S. occurred this week in Los Angeles. A hospitalized Los Angeles County resident with a compromised immune system died on Monday from the disease. No other information on the patient was released. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tracks monkeypox cases and has not confirmed any U.S. deaths. Monkeypox is spread through close skin-to-skin contact and prolonged exposure to respiratory droplets. Rare good news from the World Health Organization on the COVID-19 pandemic. The head of the World Health Organization says the number of coronavirus deaths last week was the lowest reported number in the pandemic since March of 2020, marking what could be a turning point in the years-long global outbreak. But WHO officials warn that now is the time to redouble efforts ahead of a predicted winter surge of the virus and the certainty of pandemics in the future. Eileen Alvindere reports. World Health Organization Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says COVID-19 deaths fell by 22 percent in the past week at just over 11,000 reported worldwide. Last week, the number of weekly reported deaths from COVID-19 was the low since March 2020. March 11, 2020 was when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. A few days later, the Trump administration declared a national COVID emergency and states began lockdowns. It would be about 10 months before the very first vaccines became available to the public. That all seems long ago, but Dr. Tedros said now is not the time to drop efforts to fight what is still a deadly and widespread virus. A marathon runner does not stop when the finish line comes into view. She runs harder with all the energy she has left. So must we. We can see the finish line. We are in a winning position. But now is the worst time to stop running. The World Health Organization issued a set of policy briefs for governments to strengthen their efforts against the coronavirus ahead of the expected winter surge of COVID-19, warning that new variants could yet undo the progress made to date. The WHO reported that the Omicron subvariant BA5 continues to dominate globally and comprise nearly 90 percent of virus samples shared with the world's biggest public database. In recent weeks, regulatory authorities in the U.S., Europe, and elsewhere have approved tweaked vaccines that target both the original coronavirus and later variants, including BA5. Maria Van Kerkhove, the WHO's technical lead on COVID-19, said the organization expects future waves of the disease, but was hopeful those would not cause many deaths. We expect there to be future waves of infection, um, potentially at different time points throughout the world, caused by different subvariants of Omicron or even 
different variants of concern because as you've heard us say before, the more this virus circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. But those future waves of infection do not need to translate into future waves of death because we have tools that can prevent people, that can prevent infections, can prevent transmissions, and critically the use of vaccines and vaccination uh, early use of antivirals can prevent people from developing severe disease and dying. An average of three to 400 people are still dying of COVID daily in the U.S. In California, the number is about 50 a day. I'm Eileen Alfandari for Pacifica Radio. And you're listening to the Evening News on KBFA in Berkeley, KBFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kbfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6, and we've got a half-hour edition of the Evening News at 6 on the weekends as well. All of our newscasts are archived online at kbfa.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Merkel. Public relations firms for the fossil fuel industry are ramping up more nuanced campaigns to fight off climate action and even threatening democracy. That was the story, according to witnesses at a congressional hearing today. The House Natural Resources Oversight Committee held a hearing on the subject, while a separate committee looked at legal strategies used against environmental activists. Christopher Martinez reports. The House Natural Resources Oversight Subcommittee called its hearing the role of public relations firms in preventing action on climate change. Democrat Raul Crijalba of California described the issue, saying the discussion is not just about ending oil and gas. Uh, but to expose and seek truth in advertising uh, from the gaslighting that big oil and big gas are, are doing on the American people uh, through public relations not just firms, but specific strategies uh, to, to keep the discussion from being on common ground. And that common ground, to me, is, is fact, it's science, and it is empirical information that people can deal with. The subcommittee, chaired by California Representative Katie Porter, has released a report on what it calls deceptive and misleading tactics used by public relations firms representing the fossil fuel industry. Witness Christina Arena is a former PR executive who now works on social impact filmmaking. She says the International Panel on Climate Change has called misinformation and corporate advertising primary barriers to climate action. She calls it an architecture behind climate obstruction. And she says PR firms have escaped scrutiny for their role. Like the tobacco industry, the fossil fuel industry has always relied on public relations to advocate for its interests. But what's new is the intensity of its pursuits, the complexity of its operations, and the vast resources it deploys to bulldoze regulatory obstacles in its path. She says oil and gas companies use public relations firms to simulate public support with astroturf groups and to delegitimize and intimidate their opposition. Another tactic is to use PR firms to launder their public image with greenwashing campaigns. Arena says the disinformation campaigns have not only continued, but become more nuanced. And most of these ads, they don't contain blatant lies. They contain a blend of factual omissions and distortions. So it's incumbent upon agencies to be familiar with climate delay frames, how greenwashing works, to be able to evaluate it. And from a perspective of lawmakers, to force those disclosures, especially around the third-party mobilization efforts where you have these astroturf groups, different third parties, proxies, where the fact that they are paid proxies is not revealed. Um, and again, these companies are engaging in policy matters. They're not using these practices to sell products. Another witness who worked on an anti-fracking initiative in Colorado told of an orchestrated campaign to intimidate and interfere with signature gatherers and stock volunteers. Committee Chair Porter says public relations firms declined invitations to testify at the hearing, but even so, they were not without their defenders. Amy Cook is founder and CEO of the John Locke Foundation, a free market think tank in North Carolina. Love for the First Amendment drew me to journalism. Fear of losing it drew me to public policy. She says PR firms are merely informing people about trade-offs in public policy and helping companies deal with burdensome regulatory bureaucracies. 
I've been on the ground working with those who have concerns and stories to tell regarding these trade-offs. They have a right to tell their story, and the public has a right to hear them, but they're often shut out or marginalized by legacy media, big tech, and government. While the committee was meeting, a separate oversight committee was holding a hearing on fossil fuel industry efforts to squelch protests. That involves a legal strategy known as SLAP lawsuits, short for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation, like lawsuits that have been filed against groups like Greenpeace and the Earth First Movement. Jamie Raskin is a Democrat from Maryland. Wealthy and powerful corporate entities are dragging citizens and public interest opponents through meritless but protracted and extremely costly litigation to expose anyone who dares to stand up to them to financial and personal ruin. In its work to silence its critics, the fossil fuel industry is also pushing for the passage of anti-protest laws dressed up as critical infrastructure protection statutes. Raskin is promising federal legislation to crack down on slap lawsuits. Meanwhile, Thursday will feature yet another hearing, this one on the subject of oil company profits and disinformation. Democrat Porter says she's looking forward to that hearing. We are just getting started. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Retired Army Brigadier General John Donald Bolduc won New Hampshire's Senate Republican primary today and will face potentially vulnerable Democratic incumbent Senator Maggie Hassan in the November election, setting up another test of whether a fierce right-winger can appeal to more moderate general election voters. Baltic wasn't formally endorsed by former President Trump, but has said he believes Trump won the 2020 election and has espoused conspiracy theories about vaccines, for instance. The former president called him a strong guy, a tough guy, Two other pro-Trump candidates won their U.S. House primaries in New Hampshire. Caroline Levitt in the 1st Congressional District, Bob Burns in the 2nd, leaving some in the party questioning whether they will be able to broaden their appeal beyond the Republican base in November. Nice! The Trumpiest people all won in New Hampshire last night. Make America great again, Trump wrote on Truth Social today. Dozens of candidates around the country who were openly championed by Trump or at least hewed closely to his brand helped extend Trump's hold on the national GOP. They matched primary wins up and down the ballot from Maryland to Arizona, Florida to Michigan. Some defeated Republican incumbents who had been open Trump antagonists. Primaries in New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Delaware yesterday capped the nation's primary season just eight weeks before Election Day when majorities in both chambers of Congress, key governorships, and scores of important state offices will be up for grabs. Mary Sherman filed this report. I'd be honored if the people of New Hampshire would elect me again as their governor. We have a lot more to do to protect the interests of New Hampshire citizens. New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu won the Republican nomination as he tries for a fourth term and will face Democratic nominee Dr. Tom Sherman. State Senate President Chuck Morris and retired Army General Don Bolduc were deadlocked for the Republican nomination with 44 percent of votes counted. The winner will face incumbent Democrat Maggie Hassan. Democratic incumbent Governor Daniel McKee will face Republican Ashley Kalis in Rhode Island's general election. And for the second House District... Democrat State General Treasurer Seth Magaziner will run against Republican Alan Fung, the former mayor of Cranston. President Joe Biden and the First Lady flew to Wilmington, Delaware last night and cast their ballots shortly before the polls closed for local and statewide primaries. Three new members of the House were sworn in after winning special elections, giving Democrats a nine-seat majority, including Democratic Congresswoman Mary Pelota of Alaska and two New Yorkers, Democrat Pat Ryan and Republican Joe Sembolinski. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. A former Massachusetts town official has pleaded guilty to storming the U.S. Capitol after she organized a bus trip to Washington, D.C. for fellow members of a right-wing group called Super Happy Fun America. Suzanne Iani faces a maximum sentence of six months of imprisonment and five years of probation after pleading guilty today to a misdemeanor count of disorderly conduct in a Capitol building. 
U.S. District Judge Carl Nichols is scheduled to sentence her on December 2nd. Iani was an elected member of the Natick Town Meeting while serving as Operation Director of Super Happy Fun America. The group gained national notoriety for organizing a straight pride parade in Boston in 2019. California voters in November will decide on two different gambling measures, Proposition 26 and 27. Prop 26 would increase the kind of gambling that can be done in Indian casinos in the state and allow for some sports betting. Prop 27 would allow online sports betting. Though two different measures, interest groups are working to defeat one and to pass the other in what's shaping up to be the costliest political campaign for a proposition in state history. In a two-part series, reporter Christina Anastad examines each proposition. (laughs) Yesterday, we heard about Prop 26. That's backed by dozens of Indian tribes and groups like the NAACP, but opposed by animal rights activists, some labor unions, and online gambling companies who are pushing for another proposition, number 27. Prop 27 supports financially disadvantaged tribes that don't own big casinos. By taxing and regulating online sports betting for adults 21 and over, Proposition 27. Its authors and financiers are some of the largest gaming companies in the U.S. who stand to make hundreds of millions of dollars like BetMGM, DraftKings, FanDuel, Bailey's and Penn Interactive. They've invested some $200 million so far so they can legalize online sports gambling in one of the largest economies in the world, California with ads like this. For years, California's non-gaming tribes have been left in the dust. Wealthy tribes with big casinos make billions, while small tribes struggle in poverty. Prop 27 is a game changer. 27 taxes and regulates online sports betting to fund permanent solutions to homelessness while helping every tribe in California. So who's attacking Prop 27? Wealthy casino tribes who want all the money for themselves. Support small tribes. Address homelessness. Vote yes on 27. Prop 27 would require these giant mobile gambling companies to lease with one Native American tribe in order to do business in the state. That's why the face of Prop 27 is a handful of small California tribes who are in more remote locations. Their casinos just aren't as fruitful as the larger ones. They're hoping to get a foothold in online gambling, though there's no requirement a gaming company must lease with one of them. The Middletown Pomo Indians of Northern California, which operates the Twin Pines Casino in Lake County, is one of the tribes backing Prop 27. Jose Mook Simon is a tribal chair. Middletown Rancheria has looked at the opportunities for us to grow for the next seven generations, and we're limited. Our expansion opportunities as we move forward into an e-commerce age is with mobile sports betting for the Middletown Rancheria as an option. The Solutions Act gives us an opportunity not only to address our homelessness, landless issues as we're buying our land back, but also gives us an opportunity to help the state of California, each city, each county, deal with the homelessness, mental health issues that we're all dealing with. Prop 27 is also being sold as a solution to homelessness. Tribes and sports betting companies they lease with would have to pay partial upfront fees into a new trust fund, the California Online Sports Betting Trust Fund. Here's Lee again with the nonpartisan legislative analyst's office. A tribe must pay $10 million when it receives its um, license, when it's approved, and also $1 million each time that license is renewed. The gambling companies, on the other hand, must pay $100 million when its five-year license is approved, and then $10 million each time that license is renewed. The revenues must first be used for state regulatory costs, and then after that, they're generally used for two key purposes. 85% would go to address homelessness or to support gambling addiction programs. Supporters include some homeless service providers like Jennifer Friend, CEO of Project Hope Alliance, a Southern California-based nonprofit that provides support to homeless youth. She experienced homelessness when she was younger. Permanent funding like that created by Prop 27 is a big deal for organizations like mine and the communities that we serve. It allows for us to be proactive, 
preventative, and most of all, ensure that our kids experiencing homelessness today are not adults who experience homelessness tomorrow. Critics, though, say Prop 27 is a ruse to allow giant corporations to extract the wealth of California. In uh, the recently failed attempt in Florida, they used education. In Colorado, they used clean water. Here, homelessness. And that's what they do. Dan Little is the chief intergovernmental affairs officer for the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, owners of one of, if not the largest casino in California, an hour south of Los Angeles. Last year, they became the first Native American tribe to purchase a casino in Las Vegas, competing with some of these big gambling outfits like MGM. He says Prop 27 includes loopholes like deductions that these large mobile gambling companies can claim. And few dollars would actually go to whatever charity they're purportedly funding. They use a very aggressive accounting tactics. So while they say 10%, they can deduct the licensing fee. They can deduct marketing, free play, all these things that will ultimately come out of the amount of money that will be used, uh, that will go to homelessness. So if you look in states like Colorado, Pennsylvania, Virginia... It's generally about half of what the taxes is what they actually pay. They are very aggressive in their accounting, and they provide all kinds of deductions for themselves. They even uh, have a deduction for the federal excise tax uh, written into this. 27 is a perfect example of a corporate sham. Greg Saris, chairman of the Federated Indian of Grayton Rancheria. They own the Grayton Casino and Resort in Rohnert Park, one of the largest casinos in the state. Saris is helping to bankroll opposition to Prop 27. Not one job will be created for this state. And the sham, the sham is in the loopholes. The corporates can deduct a $100 million licensing fee. What is left for the homeless? Every time, historically, Indian people have gotten something, be it oil on land in Oklahoma after the Trail of Tears or something else, Others are coming in to get it. And it is no secret that as a consequence of California Indian gaming, the world has seen that California is the golden goose. Tribes like Great and Rancheria have collectively raised nearly $200 million to sink Prop 27. And all the warring sides are on track to spend half a billion dollars on Propositions 26 and 27. They've spent more than $350 million. And there's still two months left for a final push before the November 8th election. But one question left out of the debate is should Californians expand gambling in the state at all? Since the Supreme Court ruled in favor of sports betting in 2018, 30 states have legalized it, and many of them are seeing an uptick in gambling problems, according to a new report published in August. Minors are the fastest growing group, according to the Pew Charitable Trust. The percentage of high school students with a gambling problem is double that of adults, though it's illegal for that age group. That's why the L.A. Times is endorsing a no vote for both propositions. Ultimately, it's a decision Californians will make with their ballots. And if both pass, a legal battle is sure to play out in the courts. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. This is Brian edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now!, right here on KPFA. San Francisco's new district attorney, Brooke Jenkins, has announced she will consider trying 16- and 17-year-olds as adults in cases involving what she called heinous crimes that shock the conscience of the community. Jenkins said those cases would be limited to murder, attempted murder, forcible sexual assault, kidnapping, torture, and aggravated mayhem. It's a reversal from the policy of her predecessor, Chesa Boudin, who was recalled from office in June. Boudin had barred his team from ever seeking prosecution of 16- and 17-year-olds as adults. 
Jenkins announced a new juvenile review team that would help determine whether 16- and 17-year-olds should be tried as adults. She said one factor would be whether the juvenile could be rehabilitated before the expiration of juvenile court jurisdiction and the success or failure of previous attempts at rehabilitation. Emily Goldman, the managing attorney of the Youth Defender Unit of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, said in a statement that any movement towards putting children in adult prisons is a step backwards that ignores scientific research and recent criminal justice reforms is a direct threat to community health and safety and is harmful to our youth and families. Goldman said that children in adult prisons are 500% more likely to be sexually assaulted, 200% more likely to be beaten by staff, 50% more likely to be attacked with a weapon than juveniles confined in a juvenile facility. California Governor Gavin Newsom has signed the controversial CARE Court legislation into law. It creates a new judicial system for people who are chronically homeless and have mental health struggles or addiction. Those who refuse a treatment plan could be placed under a conservatorship and forced to comply. Everybody has the capacity to flow with the forces of life. Everybody has the capacity to be fully expressive in their life. This problem is solvable. We know that. We don't have to fall prey to the cynicism um, and all the negativity that's just too big, it's too hard. It's hard, it's big, but we can meet this moment and we can create many, many moments um, in the future uh, to do justice to those that need us and are suffering and struggling. The governor says all California counties will be responsible for implementing the care court system, but seven counties are committed to doing that in the next year, including San Francisco. Newsom says the nearly $15 billion will be set aside to implement care court. For housing, as Senator Eggman said, support across the spectrum for services through our $14.7 billion dollar homeless proposal and package, $11.6 billion of community behavioral health resources, record amount of money, and yes, I heard you loudly and clearly on workforce, $1.4 billion of new money for workforce development to train the social workers, the counselors, and the staff. This is unprecedented support that we are committing to over the next few years to make this program work. The new law would let a court order a treatment plan for up to a year, which could be extended for a second year. The plan could include medication, housing, and therapy. The proposal faced criticism from some mental health and disability advocates who warned forcing people into treatment would violate their rights to informed consent. They also warned there's not enough housing available. Civil rights advocates like the ACLU also oppose the law, but Newsom defended his vision today. As someone that's out on the streets and sidewalks, that's, you know, struggling, um, self-medicating with drug or alcohol addiction, with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, paranoia, someone who's out there in and out of the criminal justice system, in and out of the emergency room, in and out of ambulances for years and years and years. You drive by every single day. They're not off the streets because they died. <laughs> They're off the streets because they were saved. That's what it looks like. Someone whose life was turned around, not someone whose life was disposed of and became a statistic in the name of compassion, in the name of the status quo. I'm not interested in the status quo. I'm not interested in the compassionlessness of the approach we have today of people moralizing and somehow suggesting and normalizing that's suffering on the streets and sidewalks. The National Union for Healthcare Workers slammed Governor Newsom for announcing 
that he'd signed the care court legislation at a facility connected to Kaiser today, noting that its mental health care workers are on day 31 of a strike because of what they call a broken health care system that forces Kaiser patients to wait for months before receiving care for mental health issues. NUHW spokesperson Mark Art said in a statement today, if Governor Newsom is serious about improving mental health care for Californians, he must take immediate action to enforce state law, get Kaiser to address the mental health needs of its members. A federal jury in Chicago convicted R. Kelly today of producing child pornography and enticing girls for sex after a month-long trial in his hometown, delivering another legal blow to a singer who was once one of the world's biggest rap stars. Prosecutors won convictions on six of the 13 counts against him, with many of the convictions carrying long mandatory sentences. But the government lost the marquee count that Kelly and his then business manager successfully rigged his state child pornography trial back in the year 2000. Eight. President Biden spent a good portion of his day showcasing his administration's efforts to promote electric vehicles at the Detroit Auto Show. Biden's a self-proclaimed car guy who owns a 1967 Corvette Stingray. He got behind the wheel of a snazzy new Corvette at the auto show amid jokes he might drive it back to Washington. But he journeyed to the auto show mostly to highlight the new climate, tax, and health care law that offers tax incentives for buying electric vehicles. He announced the approval of the first $900 million in infrastructure money to build electric vehicle charges across 53 miles of the national highway system. Kate Fisher reports. U.S. President Joe Biden's hailed his administration's investment in electric vehicles during a visit to the Detroit Auto Show. It's the largest such event in North America and is part of stepped-up travel for the president in advance of the midterm elections. Mr. Biden said that U.S. manufacturing is roaring back as he sought to refocus voters' attention away from high inflation. Companies have announced new investments of more than $36 billion in electric vehicles and $48 billion in battery manufacturing here in the U.S. Kate Fisher, Washington. Immigrants and their advocates spoke in support of legislation that would update the nation's registry and allow millions of immigrants in the country to apply for a green card. Wu Zhang Diana Park is an immigrant who's grown up in the United States. She says... H.R. 8433 would give millions of immigrants like her, known as dreamers, a sense of security they currently live without. Over 35 years, temporary solutions, proposed solutions to pathways to citizenship have been rejected time and time again, keeping me in the limbo of our broken immigration system. With the implementation of H.R. 8433, over 8 million qualified undocumented folks, such as myself, will finally be granted the status of permanent resident. Under current law, the U.S. Registry allows immigrants in the U.S. to apply for a green card if they entered the country prior to January 1st of 1972. H.R. 8433 would remove that date and allow people who have lived in the U.S. for seven or more years to apply for a green card. The legislation is sponsored by South Bay Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren. The San Francisco Bay Area North Bay was hit by an earthquake yesterday, 4.4 magnitude shake, just miles north of Santa Rosa. Rescuers are searching for a person missing in a mudslide that swept boulders down fire-scarred slopes and damaged or destroyed 30 homes in Southern California mountains. Cleanup efforts and damage assessments underway today in the San Bernardino Mountains east of Los Angeles. Evacuation orders also remain in place with thunderstorms forecast and more flash floods in the area are possible.
Morning clouds in the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow. Sunny by the afternoon with highs in the mid-60s around the bay in the mid-70s further inland. Rain is predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area by Sunday. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, tonight, possibility of strong thunderstorms. KPFA is now live streaming news headlines online. Just in case you can't listen to the radio, tune into our Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for news headlines. That's at KPFA 94.1 on Facebook and at KPFA Radio on Twitter and YouTube. Listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org.